One of the great blessings that God gave me was a wonderful family. The family that I came from in the hills of and on a farm in North Carolina. My mother and father were dedicated Christians. I have two sisters who love the Lord. One of my sisters married an evangelist that most of you've heard of, Leighton Ford. And I have one brother. He came along six years after I did. And God called him to stay at home and to work. And I don't know any man that has worked any harder. And I don't know any man that's more dedicated to Christ. And I don't know any man that I love and respect any more than I do my brother Melvin. He's never been to Southern California before. And he turned to Lauren Grisette, the mayor of Santa Ana, on the platform a moment ago, and he said, is this weather always this way? He said, I've never seen such beautiful weather. And uh, of course, Mr. Grisette, being a loyal Southern Californian, said, it's always this way. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> but I want my brother Melvin to come for the first time on the platform of any of our crusades and tell you whatever he wants to say and to tell you what Christ means to him. Let's give him a welcome to Southern California. Thank you, Preacher. You know, I feel a little bit like a um, fellow must have felt uh, some time ago, and it's an old, old one that I expect most of you have heard. In fact, I think Billy's the one that told it to me. But it fits me so well, I think I must tell it. I heard about nine years ago they were up over in the Carolina mountains taking a census of all the people and the census taker thought he was through and when he stopped at the bottom of the mountain to get some gas somebody said did you get that one little cabin way up on the hill and he looked up there and he could barely see it and he said no I believe I missed that and he said well you better go up there there may be somebody there so he couldn't drive all the way but he walked the last mile and a half and sure enough, there's a little boy out in the yard. And he was out there, had some sticks tied together, sweeping the yard. And the census taker said, boy, says, where's your mom and daddy? And he said, they're not him. He said, well, where are they? He said, well, says my daddy was hung last year. And said, well, where's your mother? She's in insane asylum. Well, you got any sisters? Yes, I got two. Well, where are they? Well, one of them's in woman's prison. And where's the other one? Well, she's at detention home for girls. Well, how about your brothers? You got any? Yes, I got three. Well, where are they? Well, my oldest brother, sheriff, shot him and killed him. Well, where's your other brother? Well, he's on chain gang. Well, I'm afraid to ask this question, but where's your third brother? Oh, he up at Harvard University. <laughs> he said, Harvard University, what in the world is he studying? <laughs> he ain't studying nothing, they studying him. So that's a little bit the way I feel uh, coming up here with Billy and with all these people. I don't know what to think, and I know they don't know what to think of me. But I didn't come here to tell a joke. I was asked to come and give my personal testimony, or a bit of it. And uh, I would say up until the last few years, or even the last few months, 
I would never get up before a crowd like this, I can assure you. And I know Cliff and Billy and T.W. Wilson and the others can verify that fact. I would never stand up before people and try to talk. And I guess maybe the beginning of it was because I did have a brother that had traveled the world over and had spoken to a lot of people. He's well known, and I'm sure that God has had his hand upon him. But somewhere along the way, it did a little something to me, and uh, it kind of made me feel kind of squashed. Now, I expect we've got some people here tonight that something along life's way has made them feel a little bit pressed down. And when somebody would ask me to even teach a Sunday school class or give my testimony, I, I wouldn't do it. Because I would think that, well, maybe they expected me to be the kind of speaker my brother is, and I knew that I just couldn't disappoint anybody like that. Therefore, I refused to do anything of that nature. But you know, I was reading in the early part of the Bible, in the book of Exodus one time, something that I certainly have not done enough of, but try to read it daily and see what God has for me. And I was reading in the third and fourth chapters of the book of Exodus. And we find God speaking to a man, and a man that didn't want to do what God had told him to do. His name was Moses, and it took the Lord a long time to train Moses. And even after he'd spent many years in training to lead a nation of people, when God said, now you're ready, Moses, to go lead a nation, you know what Moses said? And I'm not comparing myself in any way with such a man as he. But he said, Lord, People won't hear me because I've got a slow tongue and a slow mind and a slow speech. Now, nothing fitted me or fits me any better than that. I ha In other words, Moses was saying, I have no talent. Therefore, what's the use? And do you know I read that time and time again? And I began to see that, well, after all, God didn't call me to be a preacher. I believe that. I believe he placed me where I am. And I believe he did it for a purpose, so that I could be a personal witness to those that I come in contact with. And you know, I went over to the New Testament and tried to find something there. And I read in the 12th chapter of Luke about the young farmer. And that was me at that time. Who made so much he didn't know what to do with it. Well, I hadn't made that much, but I was like millions of people. I was trying to get that. And God said to this fella, when he said he was going to eat, drink, and be merry, God said to him, something that he said to very few people. He said, you're a fool. You're spending all your time on yourself and you're giving me nothing. And that began to speak to me too. This is exactly what had happened. I had used my little puny excuse to really not do and not try to do anything for God. But this is not what God wants, ladies and gentlemen, no matter who we are, no where we come from, or who our kin people are. He wants a man or a woman that's willing to let him take their life and to use it as he sees fit. And when I came to the place that I said, Lord, you know I can't get up before a group of people, much less stand up there and talk to them, He spoke to my heart and says, you let me worry about that. 
and I'll take care of all your disappointments, all your troubles, and all your difficulties, and I'll have plenty of them. And from that moment on, I've seen God change my life. I was a Christian before that. But I found out that God wants a person that is willing to let him direct his life. Me as a farmer, Billy as a preacher, Bev as a singer, Cliff as a song leader. And I believe our position, if we're called of God to do what we're doing, I believe it's just as great in God's sight as standing up in the pulpit. It's a real joy to come out here and to be with you people. And God bless you. But my, my last word would be that of the Apostle Paul. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And if he could save the Apostle Paul, who was a persecutor of Christians, he can do the same for anybody here tonight. God bless you, and it's good to be with you.